So I want to welcome Jessica Meisel. She's from Michigan State University. Here taking some training today, and she offered to do this webinar. Uh, Jessica's research seeks to understand how fire, wildfire, and prescribed and forest management influence soil ecosystem properties and processes in temperate coniferous forests. A major current focus is on quantifying black pyrogenic carbon in fire affected ecosystems and characterizing its role in soil ecosystem processes. Her interest in black carbon also includes investigating the use of biochar as a soil amendment in conifer plantations. Research and her Have group joined typically the conference. involves extensive field measurements and sampling often in remote locations, as well as laboratory analysis using wet chemistry and spectroscopic approaches. Her interest in fire ecology and management developed from experiences participating in wildfire suppression, prescribed fire management, and fire effects monitoring, and much of her research is conducted in partnership with natural resource managers in the Lake States region and in California. She is very interested in providing research that informs fire and forest management decisions and is delighted to serve as a member of the Board of Directors for the Association of Fire Ecology and as a co-PI on the Lake State Fire Science Consortium, which works to facilitate fire science information exchange between the fire research and management communities of the Lake State's region. Jessica, I'll turn the time over to you. Great. Great. Thank you, Sean. And thank you all for coming and all 57 plus of you that are joining remotely. Um, so you probably got from my uh, Sean's introduction that fire is a main focus and a main interest of mine. And so today I'm going to talk about um, fire in general, so how we understand fire behavior, some changes that we've experienced in fire regimes across the United Steve States. Michael has joined and, the conference. Um, present to you some of my, the results from my research group on how fire changes forest carbon stocks. And um, especially this figure, see this photo here on the right, um, one of my main interests is, interest is in pyrogenic carbon, or what we call black carbon. It's has joined the conference. material that is charred um, by fire. And, and so I'm here working with Rich Ferguson this week, um, learning how to create your, your soils database and learning how to do some modeling of soil properties using mid-infrared spectra. Um, and this, I'm interested in this because I just got this instrument in my own lab, and I'm still learning how to use it. Um, so uh, Science Magazine in August 2015 had this great issue on forest health. And forests um, across the world are experiencing um, Our participant has joined the conference. Um, especially in forests of the western United States, where we have this convergence of um, climate change, which is increasing the length and um, a participant uh, has joined the conference. Is there a way that I can a participant that? has joined the conference? Um, so the forests in the western United States are experiencing major pressure from changes to the length and war warmness of their growing season. And um, as a result, we're seeing um, increased incidence of these large, high severity fires. Um, in some cases, these are called mega fires when they also create major impact on human communities. So we have these um, questions about uh, these, these new fire dynamics, especially in the Western United States. And there are a lot of questions about how this impacts forest recovery and forest ecosystem processes. Um, we often hear um, about the negative impacts of fire, especially those photos I showed on the previous slide. Those will be familiar to us um, from every summer, the wildfires in the western United States. But what I want to talk about today also is that fire plays a very important ecological role and provides some very important benefits to forest ecosystems, um, such as being a, a key player, driver in cycling nutrients, especially in water-limited systems. Fire is the main agent that mineralizes um, uh, nutrients and makes converts, converts them into forms that are available. It plays a major role in creating habitat and maintaining ecological communities in systems that are adapted to fire. Um, negative impacts can occur from fire when fires are very large scale and high scale. We talk about severity. This really means the amount of impact, the magnitude of impact that a fire has on an ecosystem, how much damage. So, uh, large scale
scale and high severity fires cause extensive tree mortality, where all trees in the forest um, are killed by a fire. Extensive soil heating can sterilize soil, so you can limit the um, ability of microbial communities to convert nitri um, nutrients into forms available for plants. Um, the widespread tree mortality is associated with heavy insect pest infestations, which can then even overpower live trees and adjacent stands. And um, also, it can cause massive erosion, which uh, impacts um, aquatic habitat and can also in impact the um, economics of local communities. So what we're concerned about is the increased incidence of these large-scale high severity fires um, in forests that historically did not experience them. And here I want to describe to you how um, the fuel or the, the amount of biomass and the distribution of biomass in a forest influences the type of fire that happen. Um, we can talk about fire in terms of three primary types of fire. So on the left, this figure here shows a photo that was taken after a ground fire. And ground fires are fires that happen typically without flames. So these are smoldering fires. They occur in deep organic horizons or, or in peat soils. And they cause um, tree mortality by killing the roots. They kill the cannabis. Um, next to the root kills the cleaning tissue. Surface fires, these are flaming fires, and then we can also talk about how intense the flaming is, how much heat output is produced in these fires. These surface fires consume fuel at the forest system, so understory trees, seedlings, shrubs, um, grasses, or basic plants, down wood, the dead wood on the forest floor. And finally, the third main type is a crown fire, and these are typical of the high severity fires that are happening um, with increasing frequency in the western United States. These are um, typically started when a surface fire travels up the ladder of continuous fuels from the surface of the forest up into the canopy where um, they essentially become unsuppressible. So these are very high heat output, uh, very dangerous fires to suppress. And once they begin burning through the tree canopy, and you basically just need to stand back and wait for it to, to, to finish. Um, these crown fires result in high tree mortality because they consume the foliage in the conifer trees, and when that happens, the trees die. That's in addition to just killing the, the vascular tissue um, in the tree stem. So our concern is when forests that historically um, experienced surface fires of low to mixed severity now are increasingly experiencing these high severity fires. And this largely is a result of a change in uh, fuel structure and forest density that, that has resulted from the US history of fire suppression, but is also exacerbated by uh, these changes in climate that we've experienced. Um, so I'm going to uh, break here and show you two videos that are from a study site I have in northern Wisconsin, which is a collaboration with the Forest Service um, Research Branch and um, the Shaquamagon Nicolay National Forest. And these are both videos that we're taking during prescribed burns in our research plot. So we have uh, video cameras that are protected from heat. These videos are courtesy of my collaborator, Matt, Matt Dickinson. Um, these are both grassland plots, but the first video will show you just a grassland plot in general. Um, the second video is a grassland plot that has that has had woody fuel added to it. So the difference in fuel, though, so I want to um, draw your attention to the way the fire behaves in here. And they're very short videos. <clears throat> this one here shows a low intensity surface fire. Fire's not traveling very quickly, so it's primarily just consuming um, the grasses and the dead vegetation at the surface. Um, Okay, this next, um, this next video is a time lapse, so the fire is actually not moving as fast as it looks like it will be moving in here. But what I want you to pay attention to is how the flame length change as the fire encounters different fuels. So this is a surface fire, a lot more flaming, and then you see a flare up, um, much higher flame length fire kind of burns through these, these young trees. So those are just some um, brief visuals to kind of how fuel and the structure influences fire behavior. 
Um, across the United States, there are actually um, ecosystem types that historically experienced experience high severity sand replacing fires, and this is ecologically normal. So we're not concerned when, for example, a jack pine forest or a lodgepole pine forest experiences high severity fire because that's ecologically normal. And that forest has the adaptations, the plant adaptations that allows the ecosystem to persist after high severity fire. Um, what we are concerned about is when forests that historically experienced low to mixed severity fire um, that are now beginning to experience high severity fire because these low to mixed severity um, forest types, uh, they do not have the plant adaptations that allow the ecosystem to persist in high severity fire. So two examples of this. On the left I show here, um, this is a photo of a ponderosa pine forest. This forest has continued to fire at its regular frequency. So um, high frequency, uh, frequent fires that burn primarily at the surface. They kill small, small trees. They consume dead debris. But these large trees have very thick bark. Um, and that thick bark allows those mature trees to be able to survive um, fire relatively um, you know, up to some threshold of, of heat output. Um, uh, the adaptation, adaptation that these plants have is the, the thick bark, so they can survive um, some level of heating. On the right, this is a photo of a lodgepole pine forest. These forests historically experience fire less frequently, but when the fires do happen, they burn at much higher severity. As a result, um, almost all the, the live trees, mature trees in this forest will die when a fire happens, and that's actually ecologically normal because this species has a different kind of plant adaptation. It has serotonous cones, which are cones that are sealed, and that um, those sealed cones protect the seeds. So when a fire passes through, after the fire, the cones will, will open up, drop the seeds, and the next generation of forest persists. So in both cases, the ecosystem itself <coughs> persists, even though in ponderosa pine, the mature trees survive. In the lodgepole pine forest, the mature trees die, but the next generation starts. So these photos here illustrate that again. On the top, you see the serotonous cones. In the middle photo, you see the blackened, so these are charred um, pine cones, but they have, the scales have opened. And so the seeds drop, and we have a new forest um, regenerating. This photo on the lower left are the cones from a ponderosa pine. So you, you can see those are these are non-serotonous. The scales are open, and so when a fire burns to the canopy of a ponderosa pine forest, we not only kill the mature trees, but we also kill all the <laughs> The photo on the lower right is from one of my study sites. This is in the Chips Fire in Northern California, and this was a fire that happened in 2012. This photo here was taken um, three years after fire, and what you'll see is that 100% of the mature trees are dead. And three years after fire, there are no seedlings here. So we're concerned in this case because um, this ponderosa pine, this is actually a mixed conifer forest, ponderosa pine dominated. This forest has experienced a fire that is um, generally outside of its range of historic variability, which means that in this area, we will not have a forest in the future. That has major influence, impacts on um, the ability of this area of land to sequester carbon because we know the, car the forests are very um, very strong carbon sinks. They sequester a lot of carbon. So in this case, we have transitioned carbon from the live tree um, actively sequestering pool into the dead pool, which then that carbon becomes available for release to the atmosphere. Um, these photos here, just very briefly, these again are uh, mixed conifer forests in California. The photo on the left shows a historic structure. So historically, when fires happened frequently, fire maintained more of an open understory. Um, but as a result of fire suppression, um, many, many areas um, covered by mixed conifer forests now support this dense understory of young trees. And these young trees act as the um, ladder that carries fire from the surface and transitions into a, 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 a crown fire. So we have a confluence of um, fire, 
past U.S. fire management policy, um, a change in climate, increased pressure from insect outbreaks, and together um, the confluence of these factors really raises concern about um, the, the positive feedback between fire and climate change. Um, this slide here, I, I really like this figure. It's from Christina Santine. Um, yeah. This figure really shows where carbon is stored in a forest ecosystem. So we have carbon in the overstory, in the understory, um, shrubs, uh, seedlings, we have carbon in deadwood, the forest floor, you'll hear me say a lot, this is the organic horizon of soil. Um, when a fire happens, um, there's a, a flux of carbon to the atmosphere, but fire also can stabilize some component of forest carbon into what we'll call pyrogenic carbon. And yeah, so the next slide here shows some examples of what pyrogenic carbon is. Um, this is also called black carbon. Um, there are people who work in agriculture that will talk about biochar. And in most cases, this is um, charred organic matter. Um, pyrolyzed, it's not combusted. So a pyrolysis is a thermal decomposition of organic matter, and its characteristic is that it has um, this complex of air, multiple aromatic rings in its molecular structure. And it can exist in many different forms, from soot, um, which I won't talk about because I focus on the terrestrial ecosystem, um, to chunks of charcoal, uh, particles of char, pyrogenic carbon in the mineral soil. And the interesting thing, one of the interesting things about pyrogenic carbon is that charred biomass will experience a change in molecular composition even when the three-dimensional plant physical structures are still evident. So this um, porous structure to the charred material um, is associated with um, char in soil being associated with increased water holding capacity, increased nutrient availability, and decreased nutrient loss by leaching. And all three of those are potentially very important in um, fire-prone temperate copper forests, which often occur on sandy, well-drained nutrient poor. We know a lot about uh, the influence of biochar in agricultural soils from controlled experiments, but very little information exists about how much pyrogenic carbon is produced by wildfires in forests and what role it plays in forest ecosystem functioning. So that's what I'll be talking about today. Um, the other important thing to keep in mind is that the formation conditions really influence the physical and chemical properties of pyrogenic carbon. So the temperature at which it's heated, um, how much oxygen is present, um, how long it's heated, all that influences um, the size of the particle, its physical um, structure, and its, its chemical properties, and ultimately its role in, in soil ecosystem processes. So this brings me to the main topics I want to talk about today, which is um, to address how does fire and fire severity affect forest carbon. So I'll show you information about total carbon and pyrogenic carbon stocks in forests. Excuse me. Um, I'll show you some data about soil organic matter composition after fire and some preliminary data on carbon and nitrogen dynamics in soil after fire. Um, and again, this is all in the context of understanding what are the implications of a fire regime shift as forests have historically experienced this kind of fire, surface fires, transitioning to forests that now are experiencing um, a high severity fire. Okay, so this slide here, this is a map showing um, my study sites, which are located in northern lake states as well as in uh, Northern California. And together, this uh, collection of sites allows me to investigate um, differences in forest and soil response to fire across severity gradients within individual wildfires, and also to be able to evaluate how does the response differ across these forest types that are adapted to um, different forest fire regimes. So the data I will show you today will come from several of these different study sites, rather than focusing on just one um, study site. 
So the next uh, several slides will be bro broken up into three topics. Um, one here is a project on quantifying <laughs> wildfire impacts on above ground and below ground total carbon and pyrogenic carbon. Um, this data comes from mixed conifer forests in California. And you think back to that figure I showed you with where carbon is distributed in the forest. Um, in this project, we measured carbon in the overstory, so the tree layer, the understory, um, seedlings, shrubs, in the woody debris or dead wood pool, and then also in the soil, both the organic rise and our forest floor, and in the mineral soil. Um, the, these data come from five major wildfires that happened in mixed conifer forests in California. And this um, is one of the most exciting projects that I'm working on right now. It's also very difficult to access uh, active wildfires. So for this, this um, project, I work with a team of specialized wildland firefighters called the FBAT, or Fire Behavior Assessment Team. And they are actually able to access active wildfires to instrument research plots um, before a fire happens. So when a fire happens, they identify where they expect the fire to burn, they install their research plot, take their pre-fire measurements and samples, and then as soon as the fire burns through that plot, they go back and they retrieve um, their, their instruments and also take post-fire um, measurements and samples. So I have soil samples, soil soil samples from five major wildfires, each with multiple plots inside each wildfire. Um, and to my knowledge, this is a pretty globally unique data set because it's so difficult to access. Um, wildfires. So um, for the next few slides, they'll have these paired photographs on them. And these photos are taken from the same photo point within a study plot. And they'll show the pre-fire condition and the post-fire condition, just to give you some visual about what, the, what impact the fire had. In this study, um, the majority of plots burned at high severity. So in this study, I'm just showing you um, overall fire effects on, on these forest carbon pools. And my slides will, my figures will show, follow a common format. So I'll show my response variable on the y-axis, um, my uh, measurement category on the x-axis, and in this figure, this panel on the right, on the upper right corner, I have the pre-fire condition in the green bar, fire condition in the bar, and then the change um, between pre and post. That is shown in the gray bar. So in the panel in the upper right shows um, the number of trees in the live category and the dead category before and after fire and the difference. So this figure shows us that the majority of trees in these forests were converted from the live tree pool into the dead tree, dead tree pool. Um, if we look at the carbon that is stored in, that, in those trees um, using published biomass uh, allometric equations to calculate biomass and biomass carbon, um, we actually find that there's, there's no statistically significant difference between the pre-fire carbon and the post-fire carbon um, if we look at the tree layer in total or in each component of the tree. So major shift in live versus dead, but no big release of carbon from the trees. Um, we did measure pyrogenic carbon from the trees. I'm not going to show you all the slides from this study of time here. Um, pyrogenic carbon is primarily produced just in the bark by charring the bark, and it's, it's a very minor, like less than 2% of above ground carbon. Um, what we find here is that, um, again, less than 2% of overstory carbon was released um, by, by fire in, the, in these fires. Um, and in fact, we found that the majority of carbon that's lost from fires is lost from the organic horizon of soil. Um, and we've looked at the organic and upper five centimeters of mineral soil. Um, we lose more carbon from those layers than from across the whole forest in general. So the, the oh. organic horizon soil is the main source of carbon flux in the atmosphere. Um, and what we found is that in the um, organic horizon or the forest floor layer, we actually lose 90, nearly 90% 90 of that carbon. And from the mineral soil, we lose approximately 20%. And again, this is only from the upper five centimeters of mineral soil. And I restrict to that depth because mineral soil in general does not conduct very well. So where I expect the largest impact of fire is really in the upper surface centimeters. Um, this figure here shows pyrogenic carbon. 
um, which we assess in the organic horizon using um, drift spectroscopy. And in the mineral horizon, which is kind of hidden here, um, we assess that with a nitric acid digestion, wet chemistry digestion in the lab. Um, the important thing here is that these forests historically experienced frequent um, low to mixed severity fire. So pyrogenic carbon exists in these forests before this most recent fire. And you'll see here in the organic horizon, uh, there's actually quite a bit, about 16 um, metric tons per hectare of pyrogenic carbon. And we lose about 66% of that pre-existing pyrogenic carbon as a result of the fire. Um, we also lose about almost 30% of pre-existing pyrogenic carbon from the upper horizon of the mineral soil. Um, this is important because there's a lot of interest in the literature on estimating how much pyrogenic carbon is created by fire. And there's estimates ranging from between 1 to 15% of forest biomass is converted into the, um, 1 to 15% of forest carbon is converted into the pyrogenic carbon pool. Um, but what this shows is that in, in these forests, in California mixed conifer forests, we, re, we end up with a net loss of pyrogenic carbon. So this is important because if this pyrogenic organic matter, pyrogenic carbon, plays an important role in um, regulating water availability or nutrient cycling in mineral soils, we are um, compromising the potential source of pyrogenic carbon to the mineral soil. So by uh, experiencing a shift in fire behavior in these forests, we're potentially influencing this key, key player in um, forest ecosystem, forest soil ecosystem processes. When we sum the impact of fire on total carbon and on um, pyrogenic carbon, across the whole ecosystem, so all layers of the forest, um, overstory down to mineral soil. If we look at total carbon here on the left, the difference between pre-fire total forest carbon and post-fire total forest carbon is not statistically significant. Um, we do see a statistically significant difference in the pyrogenic carbon stocks across the whole ecosystem. And in fact, um, we have a net loss of 54% of pre-existing pyrogenic carbon from these forests. Um, and I think that's all I want to say about those. Um, so to uh, summarize those past two slides, the main takeaway point is that um, in these forests, the rate of formation for pyrogenic carbon is actually quite low. And in fact, we observed a net loss of pyrogenic carbon from these ecosystems. Um, one thing I think I forgot to mention is that pyrogenic carbon, um, with that dominance of aromatic compounds in its molecular structure, that is associated with stability in the environment. So um, this charred material is perceived to be much more stable in the environment than uncharred material because it's more difficult for microbes to access the nutrients in those compounds. Um, so the interest in pyrogenic carbon is really on um, its role in stabilizing carbon in forests and its role in influencing um, e soil ecosystem dynamics. But in this case, we actually see we have less stable carbon in the post-fire forest than in the pre-fire forest. And the greatest losses of carbon and pyrogenic carbon that we saw occurred from the organic horizon rather than from the tree layer. Um, the unanswered questions here are really about um, how quickly does pyrogenic carbon become incorporated into forest soil. What we observed in our post-fire measurements is that most of the pyrogenic carbon is still present. Even though we, we observed a major loss from the organic horizon, um, the, the post-fire organic horizon, residual organic horizon, is still where most of the pyrogenic carbon occurs. The measurements I have are nearly immediately after fire. So if we're thinking about um, the source of pyrogenic carbon into mineral soil in the future, these estimates from my data um, will not reflect how much pyrogenic carbon is actually available to become incorporated because my samples were taken before erosion happened. So as, as soon as the first rainfall event comes, 
um, nearly all their pyrogenic carbon in that residual forest floor layer will likely get eroded um, downslope and downstream. Over time, um, charred bark on the fire-killed trees will fall off and incorporated into the forest floor and the mineral soil. Um, but that's actually a, a pretty small percentage of the overstory carbon. So overall impact of fire is that we lose um, some carbon, uh, we lose a lot of pyrogenic carbon, and we convert um, all the live trees into the dead tree pool, which those are then susceptible. That the carbon in the dead trees will then be susceptible to loss in the next fire. Okay. So part two, I'm going to talk about um, fire effects across the gradient. And I'll focus on two of my study sites. The first one here is Kagami Creek Wildfire, which was a record fire that happened in northern Minnesota in uh, late summer of 2011. This burned almost 40,000 hectares, um, and 75% of that area burned in a single five-hour period. Um, this map here, this is from uh, my collaborator, um, uh, Phil Townsend at University of Wisconsin-Madison. And this shows severity mapped using remote sensing imagery, where the warmer colors indicate higher severity, and the cooler colors indicate lower severity. So we have plots distributed um, throughout this, on the northern edge of this um, fire, and also down here, including um, control plots that did not burn. Um, the canoeing picture here shows how we actually get to our sites, because this is in the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness, so no motorized vehicles are allowed. Um, the second site I'll show you data from is also from California Mixed Conifer Forest. This is from the Chips Fire, Northern California. Again, um, in both these cases, Pagami Creek and um, the Chips Fire, I'll show you data that was collected three years after fire. So we're really looking at the persistent influence of fire on ecosystem properties. Um, this figure here shows soil carbon content on the y-axis and my severity classification on the x-axis. These data are from the California site. What we find is that in the forest floor layers, uh, we actually don't see differences among severity levels at all three years after fire. But we do see that burned areas differ from unburned areas, period, but no differences among severity. In the forest floor, which I should say, this is forest floor is shown in the gray portion of the bar, in the mineral soil carbon um, content is shown in the black bars. When we look at the mineral soil, we see that there are no differences in carbon content, burned or unburned, or across severity levels. So this suggests that fire does not impact mineral soil carbon. Um, but if we look at the carbon to nitrogen ratios in the mineral soils, we in fact see that there is a decrease, statistically significant decrease in the carbon to nitrogen ratio in the burned areas relative to unburned areas. Again, we see no differences among severity levels. So this tells us that the, the impact of fire matters, but um, the severity of a fire does not matter. This is part of the story. This is somewhat an artifact of the scale at which we classified severity, because when we look at relationships between fire severity and um, soil impact at a much uh, uh, assessing fire severity at a smaller scale, we actually do see a more clear pattern, OK? So some an artifact of how we, uh, the scale at which we classified fire severity. But here, what I want you to notice is that we have a decrease of carbon to nitrogen ratio, even when we see no impact on total carbon. So this suggests to us that fire has an impact on organic matter composition, even when we have no, we can see no impact of fire on total carbon stock. Um, these data are from California, but we actually observed um, very similar patterns of response in our Minnesota sample. Okay? Both two very different forest types, both measured three, three years after fire. So to investigate fire impact on organic matter composition, um, I used solid state nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And the, on these spectra, on the upper, the upper spectrum was taken from an unburned um, forest floor horizon, um, moderate severity classification in the middle, and then high severity on the on the bottom. And this ye area, this yellow bar, highlights the area associated with aromatic carbon compounds. So what we see is that the 
um, relative size of this aromatic peak increases as we go from unburned forest floor material to burned to higher severity forest floor material. Um, and this, this air, these aromatic compounds, remember, are associated with pyrogenic carbon. So I took the data from the NMR spectra and used them in a molecular mixing model from Jeff Baldock at CSIRO and calculated the um, component pools of, um, of the overall soil organic matter. This figure, again, I show severity on the x-axis. My total carbon is shown by the total height of the bar, and the soil organic matter component is shown by these different shading areas. For each severity level, I have my forest floor bar on the left and the, the mineral soil on the right. And what we see here, oh, what I want to draw your attention to is the carbohydrate pool, shown in the um, white patch bar, and the lignin pool, which is black, and then the char or pyrogenic carbon um, here. And what we see is that in the forest floor, we have a decrease in the carbohydrate pool. We have a decrease across the severity gradient in the lignin pool, and an increase in the pyrogenic carbon pool. In the mineral soil, um, the pattern is a lot more fuzzy, so you can squint. You kind of see a decrease in the carbohydrate pool. Um, kind of maybe not really sure what's going on in the lignin pool. And again, no clear pattern in the pyrogenic carbon pool. So again, the greatest impact we see from fire occurs in the organic horizon. And with a loss of the labile component, um, the carbohydrate component of soil organic matter, and a gain in the very, um, I'll call it recalcitrant, it's not really the right word to use anymore, um, the resistant pool of soil organic matter, which is the pyrogenic carbon. Um, and uh, in both our California and our uh, Minnesota sites, what we see is that uh, across the severity gradient, gradient we, lose, um, we lose carbon in um, the forest floor layer. We lose pyrogenic carbon in the forest floor layer, but the residual forest floor layer, um, the concentration of pyrogenic carbon in the total carbon in that layer increases with severity. So we have less total material left, but more of what is left is increasingly concentrated with pyrogenic carbon as we travel across the severity gradient. OK, why is this important? Um, because the composition of organic compounds into soil influences decomposition dynamics and mineralization dynamics. Um, composition of organic compounds influences the rate at which nutrients are cycled and made available to plants. Um, and it influences the carbon flux rate um, as a result of soil respiration. These are important in terms of the overall forest ecosystem recovery after fire and the carbon balance in these forests after fire. So when we investigated um, rest soil respiration rates after fire, these samples were taken um, three years after fire from our California site. And we performed a long-term laboratory incubation measuring um, soil respiration rates. And what we find is that across this whole year, the, uh, the overall differences, the overall patterns we see in terms of severity is that moderate and soils that were collected from areas burned at moderate or high severity have a statistically um, lower soil respiration rate than soils that were collected from areas that were unburned or burned at low severity. Okay? Um, this is a persistent impact of fire. Three years after fire, we're still seeing differences in soil respiration rates. What we don't know yet is how closely this is, um, how strongly this is influenced by microbial community composition versus organic matter composition in these samples. If we have data that will help us answer both those questions, they're forthcoming, but I don't, I'm not showing them today here. Um, in our Minnesota sample, uh, Minnesota site, I performed a field incubation to investigate nitrogen mineralization rates again, across the severity gradient. And these figures, severity is given a number. So zero is unburned, uh, four is high severity. What we see is that 
there's a statistically significant influence of severity level um, on both ammonification rate and net nitrification. And really, we see this um, big crash in um, nitrogen mineralization rate um, between burned and unburned. And we have a, a trend towards a decrease in nitrogen mineralization rate with severity level. Okay, again, this is three years after fire, so it's a persistent impact of fire on soil ecosystem processes. Um, so to tie this back in with uh, a shift in fire regime, we've done other um, laboratory incubations that have shown us that the type and the amount of charred material that we add to soil influences carbon and nitrogen mineralization rates. These are important ecosystem, soil ecosystem functions. These, this panel here on the right um, shows three different types of pyrogenic carbon material that was produced in uh, uh, sand replacing fire in Michigan jack pine forest. On the top panel A, we have charred bark. In the middle, um, this is charred pine cone material. And C, this is, these are SEM images scanning electron microscopy. Um, C shows the vascular structure of charred um, dead wood material. And so you can see visually there are physical differences among these different types of charred um, material. Um, this panel on the left shows that there are also chemical differences in terms of their elemental ratios. So this is important because if a forest that historically experienced surface fires now begins experiencing um, a high severity or calm fire, we are charring, we're creating different types of pyrogenic materials compared to the types of pyrogenic carbon input that the forest experienced historically. Okay, so just to sum up um, parts two and three, um, my research shows that fire leaves, an imp uh, leaves a signature on soil organic matter composition. Um, again, we see the greatest impact on the organic horizon, which makes sense because that actually directly experiences the effects of fire. Um, we see a persistent decrease in carbon and nitrogen mineralization rates, um, and with a pattern that shows there's a the magnitude of decrease increases with severity level. Um, Forthcoming data on microbial community composition and activity will help us really understand if that decrease um, is associated with organic matter composition versus microbial fire impacts on microbial communities. Um, and then finally, what we're seeing is that a pyrogenic carbon type and amount matter for carbon and nitrogen mineralization rates. And again, tying this back into shifting fire regimes, um, a shift in fire regimes will change the amount and type of pyrogenic carbon input to forest ecosystems. Okay, so um, you know these are ongoing projects, and we're still working to understand really um, what are the impacts of a change in fire severity in these forest ecosystems. Um, what are the, what fire behavior drivers really influence the severity level that we can observe in the field? and categorize in the field that we then use to classify the responses we see. Um, the whole ecosystem pyrogenic carbon estimates. This data globally are very limited. Um, the, the results I have shown are from a mixed conifer forest in California. Um, the only other whole ecosystem pyrogenic carbon stock study I know of was from Boreal Jack Pine Forest by Christina Santin and her colleagues. Um, and these questions about what role does pyrogenic carbon play in natural environments is um, wide open, very little understood about that. Um, this work, I think, is very exciting because so little information um, exists about it. But it's also full of challenges, and especially logistical challenges, um, and hazards, especially associated with accessing active wildfires, which is very challenging to impossible. Um, and in burn sites, even the ones we access after the fire has happened, um, there are some major safety hazards we need to be aware of, like falling trees and access to these very remote sites. Um, pyrogenic carbon quantification methods. I showed you the slide that illustrates the uh, range of characteristics that exist across this broad uh, suite of materials we call pyrogenic carbon or black carbon. And different methods are better or worse for measuring specific um, of that spectrum of characteristics. 
um, and a postdoc working in my group, Bernardo Maestrini. Um, we just published a methods advancement paper in organic geochemistry earlier this summer, um, trying to help us have better tools for how we do these measurements. And again, that's kind of why I'm here, to learn more about mid-infrared spectroscopy and using um, MIR spectra to help model soil properties. Um, and then just this final slide, this highlights the newest project, which, which is um, understanding soil heating processes in the context of a Pine Barrens restoration project in northern Wisconsin near Ashland. Um, and you see the research team here. Um, here's on the lower left of the figure one of our fires. These are large-scale prescribed burns, but large-scale in the terms of um, 1,500 to 3,000 um, acres. And, and then these, here we are trying to measure all the black stuff that's produced from the fire and many other things also. And I think that's it. Um, definitely um, my collaborators, um, these are resource and projects. And definitely um, thanks to them for their support and our funding agencies and um, Pedro and Maggie that give me an excuse for getting outside and walking around once in a while. And I'd be happy to take any questions you have. Thank you, Dr. Meisel. That will uh, conclude our seminar. Thank you, Dr. Meisel, for your time and effort to make this presentation today. And thanks to all participants for joining in. We had more than 80 people join today's webinar. On, the on-demand recording of this webinar will be available on our NSSE YouTube channel within a couple of days, so please feel free to let your colleagues know about this training opportunity. This concludes our webinar presentation.